it's an almost meditative activity for me. If I'm busy with my fishing rod on the beach, just hearing the sea, I basically forget about everything else. It's very difficult to put in words, but microbes just fascinate me. If you look through a microscope at yeasts, they look extremely simple. You see larger cells that bud off daughter cells, they grow. It looks as simple as it can be. We know yeast from very classical applications like baker's yeast, and the rising of bread dough, brewing of beer. Insulin is made with genetically engineered baker's yeast, and I could go on. We can change the DNA in a, in a very precise and defined manner, and then quantitatively measure what the effect of that is on how fast the yeast grows, or even to endow them with completely new capabilities, making a novel product, and that's what we call metabolic engineering. Half a year before I embarked on the biology study, I still thought I would be an animal doctor. I gave up on that idea and chose biology instead. We had to learn about animal morphology and plant anatomy and systematics, and uh, that didn't work wonders for my motivation in the first year. I came close to calling it quit. And then in the second year, we had research practicals. The experiment I still vividly recall, not surprisingly, involved fish, carp in, in particular. And carp have a wonderful ability to survive under ice, and they do so by alcoholic fermentation. For the first time, I got the feeling that we were doing something that no one might have done before. And that is something really, really appealing to me. During my PhD, I worked on thiobacilli, a bacterium that oxidizes iron, and they use a rusting process to gain energy and thereby to, to grow, thrive and survive. These microorganisms are used in metal mining, in leaching of minerals to get the precious metals out. My desk, for some reason, was already in the midst of a, a group of, of yeast researchers who were making fun of me because the, the biomass concentrations in my cultures were orders of magnitude lower than in, in theirs. I might have had a feeling that, that yeast was a rather mundane uh, organism and I was working on these extreme files that were very special. But it became clear that even in very well-studied organisms, there's still so much we don't understand. Our entry in the, the wonderful world of, of genomics uh, started at the end of the, the 1990s. By a, a stroke of luck, we were approached by American scientists. They were interested in our bioreactor technology and was working on the forefront of this technology, DNA microarrays, which enabled us to see the expression of all 6,000 genes in yeast, quantitatively. That was the entry ticket into something that became the, the Kluiver Center for Genomics of Industrial Fermentation. The Dutch government invited scientists to propose plans for centers of excellence in genomics research. We got together with a, a group of people and we said, let's go for this. Subsequently, the, the colleague said, well, uh, Jack, we think you should lead this initiative. I was not at all convinced that I would be able to, to do that, but I took on that task. The business plan had been filed, it had been approved, cheers all around, and from one day to the other I couldn't read the newspaper anymore and was at home with a burnout. All energy was gone. I felt disconnected from things that I'd always enjoyed. I've always loved science, but there was also a great difficulty believing that I was successful, that I did get a permanent staff position at the university, that I did become full professor at 35. It's probably all just one big coincidence and, and one day I will be found out. The first phase of recovery was simply taking distance and learning to accept this. Fishing was sort of therapeutic. It was part of a daily rhythm to go outside, to be active, not to, to worry or to despair, do something I love doing and leave the rest for later. Second ingredient, professional help. 
absolutely essential. I really couldn't imagine for a couple of months that science had ever meant something to me. But I can also remember the exact moment when it came back. An Australian postdoc was about to leave the lab and said, well, I really want to have a chat with you. Can we go for a walk on the beach? And as we were walking along the beach together, I suddenly found myself asking questions to him about the work at the lab. How is this going? How is that going? And it was as if a light switched on. And that, that was a very special moment. One challenge was always out there. Xylose makes up a lot of the sugars in agricultural residues. Corn is used to extract the corn starch, but that still leaves a lot of plant material that might potentially be converted into valuable products. There had been attempts to look for enzymes and genes that might enable the baker's yeast to make ethanol out of xylose. The pathway that had been most deeply explored is a fairly complicated one. And on paper, there was a simpler way involving a single enzyme, xylose isomerase. For about 10 years, no group had yet succeeded. A colleague, Huub Optenkamp, was studying a, a completely fascinating and, and weird group of, of fungi called Neocalamasticomycetes. They are sort of gene collectors. They've managed to collect multiple bacterial genes, genes you'd not normally encounter in fungi. And Huub was interested in these organisms because in the gut of, of large herbivores, they play a role in degrading cellulose, so woody material. And Huub thought, well, what would be the best place to look for, for these fungi? In elephant dung, of course. But he also found something else. This was a fungal xylose isomerase. And Huub told me this over a cup of coffee. And I went a little bit berserk because yeast is also a fungus. And ultimately that led to engineered yeast strains that have been applied at full scale for converting agricultural residues into ethanol. Everyone in the field felt that if we crack this problem of second generation uh, by ethanol production, it will be uh, also an economic huge success. In the meantime, the oil price declined again and the small number of very large scale plants, they've all interrupted or, or stopped production. That doesn't mean that uh, second generation bioethanol doesn't have a future. There will be agricultural residues with a lot of sugar in there that might be converted into aviation fuel. That's a field that has been and also in the future will continue to be very important, not to stay completely dependent on the use of fairly high value of refined sugars, where production of the, the feedstock for fuel production starts to compete with food production. My own research is more geared towards um, accessing substrates that we can make ultimately from green electricity and CO2 and convert it into added value compounds. If I'd have to pick one favorite aspect of, of working in academia, it would probably be, be teaching. It's tremendously enriching to, to teach, to share things, but also to learn from students. So having gone through this burnout, it's become the best learning experience in my life. And also it helps me to connect with people who find themselves at the depth of such a traumatic experience. We see a lot of that around in academia, and I, I think we can do more to help, especially very young students and early career scientists to face those issues and give some confidence that you can come out stronger. Right now, fishing is definitely not a therapeutic activity. It's a hobby. It may have a, a signaling function. If ever I find myself thinking of work while I'm fishing, it's probably time to, to book a short holiday.